Seat. Hey, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Ilaf. I am the youth and community engagement coordinator here at SNN. Thank you all for joining us. I know we're running a little bit late, but in college, it's going to be a very special session tonight. Um, as you guys may know, we have two youth rooms that are operating all through Ramadan. They open up at 10 p.m. So once you're done your salah, you can come and hang out in the youth hub for sisters or the education center for the brothers. You can come, grab some pies, coffee, and you know, just hang out in the um, And we usually open until 10 p.m. We are hosting a sister's in charge on Wednesday that did sell out with 500 registrants. It's crazy. Excited to see you guys, but I know a lot of you are going to get into the register. So we're going to have another sister's in charge the following Monday, inshallah. So hopefully, we're going to get to you there. Um, is it Monday or what? It's on Monday, inshallah. And then the brothers, um, again, we had our brothers in charge last week. Wednesday also, also sold out of 300 registrants, so inshallah we'll be doing another one on Wednesday for brothers. Um, without, without further ado, I am going to hand it over to the speaker. Just got off the flight today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I'm not going to take up more time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الهادين المحتدين وعلى التابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I'm not gonna get on to you about the weak response we're all tired الحمد لله I just came off a flight myself like a four or six hour flight I dropped my bags off at my brother Yusuf's house and then I made my way down here. So I'm more tired than you guys, but inshallah, forgive me if I make any mistakes or if I don't speak clearly or if my words kind of slur or if I fall asleep as I'm giving the talk. It's been a rough couple. It's been a rough life. It's been a rough life. Anyway, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us and he's gathered us here today in a house from amongst his houses. And it's beautiful to see that in the month of Ramadan, a time when maybe 10 or 20 years ago, it would have been our elders and our uncles and our fathers and our aunties and our mothers giving life to the masjid during the nights of Ramadan to see, mashallah, an amazing group of young people organizing themselves and dedicating themselves to the service of the deen. And this is beautiful and it's something that we can have hope in because... Allah tells us through the Prophet وسلم, that there will be seven people who are under the shade of Allah on the day where there's no shade except his shade. These people are Al-Imam Al-Adil, the just ruler. And that's a very, very difficult thing to be. If we follow modern day politics, we know how difficult that is. A person whose heart is attached to the masjid, a person who isolates themselves and remembers Allah until tears flow from their eyes, the person who <coughs> gives in charity with their right hand to the point that their left hand does not know what their right hand has given. The person who is approached by a man who is approached by a beautiful woman in order to engage in something haram and he refuses and he says, I fear Allah. And then the last two are the easiest or the hardest, depending on how you look at it. One of them is the person, two people who love each other for the sake of Allah, they meet each other for the sake of Allah and they depart for the sake of Allah. And the other one is the youth that is raised in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at the classical definitions of youth, they say that the peak of youth is 33. So we all have a chance, inshallah, to be included in that category. And they say that adult, true adulthood begins at 40 years old. So everything under 40 is considered a form of youth. So if we are, mashallah, in our 20s, looking at the crowd, maybe some people are pushing 30 or past 30. But generally, <clears throat> we'll give everyone the benefit of the doubt and say that we're all in our 20s. Then we have hope in Allah and we pray that we can be included in at least one of these seven categories. Either we are the young people that were raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're spending our youth. We could be outside on a, is it Friday today? I don't even know what day of the week it is. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, Sunday night, nothing's popping in Toronto. But we could be outside doing anything. Alhamdulillah, we've managed to come here to the masjid, attach our hearts to the masjid, 
and spend time remembering Allah and speaking about Allah and doing things that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month. And other than that, if we're not included amongst that category, then we have hope that we can be included amongst the category that are those who love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've gathered here for that and we will depart for that. For many of us, I mean, Yusuf introduced me to his cousins earlier, but for the most part, most of us are not related to each other by blood. Most of us are not related to each other through business. Most of us are not related to each other through anything that connects us in the affairs of the dunya. We're connected to each other because of Islam. We're connected to each other because of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And so if we come together upon that and we depart from each other upon that, we can inshallah be included amongst those people who are under Allah's shade on your muqiyamah. And there's another hadith that gives us even greater hope is the hadith that's narrated by one of the Sahaba. And I read this hadith recently when I was studying, re-studying the Muwat of Imam Malik with one of my teachers. It was a very interesting hadith. So this hadith, one of the tabi'een, he met one of the Sahaba in Damascus. At that time, many of the Sahaba had gone to Damascus as the Islamic empire had expanded and Sham had become part of the Islamic territory. And so when he went, and his name was Abu Idris al-Kawlani, when he went there, he went to the masjid and he saw a man who was smiling and he had a radiant face in the masjid. And he was a young person, but everybody had gathered around this person and they were benefiting from his knowledge and they were talking to him. And when he came to ask who this person was, that person was a sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. And from the benefit that he was receiving from this sahaba and the way that he was, he was seeing the sahaba being accepted by the people, he came up to the Sahaba and he said to him, Wallahi, I love you for the sake of Allah. And the Sahaba smiled and he responded. He said, is what you said true? And he said, yes, Wallahi, it's true. And so he hugged him and he said, then glad tidings to you because the Prophet wasallam, we heard from him that Allah has said, so this is the Hadith Qudsi, وَجَبَتْ مَحَبَّتِي لِلْمُتَهَابِينَ فِي وَالْمُتَزَاوِرِينَ فِي وَالْمُتَجَالِسِينَ فِي وَالْمُتَبَادِلِينَ فِي he said that my love has been made obligatory, meaning Allah himself has said, I have made it an obligation upon myself to love those who love each other in me and who visit each other in me and who sit down with each other in me and who spend on each other in me. And they will be under my shade on the day where there is no shade except my shade. So just merely attending these kind of gatherings and being a part of these kind of organizations and coming to these, uh, these kind of events are something that can give us and guarantee us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same way he's made it obligatory for us to pray and to fast, and we have a choice as to whether we want to follow or we don't want to follow. Allah has made it obligatory for himself to love those who love each other for him and who visit each other for him and who sit down with each other for him. There's even another hadith when the Prophet wasallam was saying, that there was a man who was traveling to a town that was uh, far away from his town. And so Allah sent an angel in the form of a human being to stop this man and to ask him where he was going and why he was going there. And so the man responded to the angel and he said, I'm going to visit one of my brothers. And they said, are you visiting him for some kind of dunya or, you know, is there a business deal or is there something, you know, going on that is of benefit in the physical world? And the man said, no, I'm just visiting that person because I love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the angel said, I am an angel sent by Allah to tell you that Allah has told you or he wants to tell you that he loves you because you love this person for his sake. And so <clears throat> the theme today of what I'm going to talk about, which is completely different from the theme that they gave me, but this is what I feel like talking about right now, so I'm going to end up doing it is this whole thing of loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I feel as though, even when we think about taqwa and when we think about worshipping Allah, for many of us, the focus is always fear of Allah or fear of the punishment of Allah. And nobody ever talks about the aspect of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't want to make it sound, you know, too fuzzy, like I'm trying to, you know, tell you something that's not in the Quran or in the Sunnah. But... One of the main reasons, and I was reading earlier a book by one of the great scholars of the past, his name was Ibn al-Juzayt, and he was a very, very excellent scholar when it came to tafsir of the Qur'an. 
And so he has a book called Tasfiyah Tul Qulub, Purification of the Hearts, in which he talks about the different spiritual stations that a Muslim should attain, strictly from a Quranic perspective and looking at it through the Quran. And so <clears throat> connecting this back to the month of Ramadan, Allah tells us in the month of Ramadan that we're obligated to fast. And in the verse where he reveals to us the reason why we should fast, he says, That he has made fasting obligatory upon us the same way he made it obligatory upon those who came before us in order for us to achieve taqwa. And so taqwa is always translated as fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is an accurate translation. But it's fear in a different kind of sense than the fear that we usually know. If we talk about fear in the general sense, in Arabic, the word that is used is khawf. Allah talks about the awliya, his friends, he says, in awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa la hum The friends of Allah are those who do not have fear and they do not grieve. Alladina amanu wa kanu yattaqun. They are the people who believed and they also had taqwa. So we know that taqwa in terms of fear is a deeper kind of relationship with Allah than merely just being scared of him. Taqwa comes from the word or is related to the word wiqaya, which means to protect. And the essence of this is that you're protecting your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from anything that can destroy that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a different kind of fear. When I was given tafsir in California, I gave the example of a husband and a wife. Most times when you see people get married, the husband is always taller and stronger and bigger than the wife. There's some exceptional cases, but generally, when you ask most girls what they look for in a husband, one of the top three attributes is that he should be taller than them. And he should be stronger than them. If not, there might be issues. But if you think about a husband that's married to it's never that that is stronger than another person will be scared of them. But then sometimes you'll be out with your boys and then you look at the time and the married ones start looking at the watch and they're like, oh, it's nearly 1 a.m. I need to get home because they're scared. <laughs> the people are laughing because they got married friends and they know. Are they scared that the wife is going to do something to them? Or is it that they're scared of maintaining the peace and the love that they have in the relationship with the wife? It's more of a motivation to maintain the love between the couple than to be scared that when you get home, there's going to be some case of domestic violence or whatever. It does happen. May Allah protect us. But, you know, generally, it's about maintaining the love. And so when Ibn Jizay talks about the different motivations for taqwa, he levels them and he makes about 10 different motivations for taqwa in order of how serious and how beautiful they are. So he starts with the lowest motivation for taqwa, and that is khawf min adabu dunyawi. That is, being scared of some punishment that will afflict you in this life. And we see some people, for example, like I had friends, anytime something's going wrong in life, they're like, okay, I need to start praying. Things are going wrong. I'm not getting this business deal. This is not going through. It's because I'm not praying. And they get back on their deen and they start practicing because things are going wrong in this life. They're not thinking about, per se, the relationship with Allah. They're not thinking about, per se, the rewards of the akhirah that they might be missing out on. They're thinking about the immediate effect of what their worship is doing to them in this life. They feel as though the relationship with Allah is affecting their risk, it's affecting their livelihood, it's affecting their business. And so they have some form of taqwa as a motivation for that. And then the second motivation would be khawf min adhabul ukhrawi, having fear of punishment in the next life. Thinking about the hellfire, thinking about the punishments reserved for those who don't obey Allah and those who don't have taqwa and all of these things that can also be a motivation and it's a higher motivation than being scared of something that will affect you in the dunya. And then we see <clears throat> the fear of something affecting your deen. You're, ups you're upset or you're scared that you might lose your iman. Your iman will be weak, your iman will go low. All of these kind of things can be motivations. And then you see, for example, fear of the hisab. People are not even thinking about the punishment of the akhirah yet. They're thinking about even Allah calling them to account for their deeds. Some people will be ashamed and they'll say, how can I 
approach Allah on the Day of Judgment with all of these sins and they think about the embarrassment of being in front of Allah and Allah asking us about everything that we've done in the dunya. That's also a motivation to have taqwa. And then we see other motivations, hope for rewards in this dunya. We know, for example, Allah says, Whoever has taqwa of Allah, then Allah will always provide for them a way out of their difficult situations and will give them risk from where they never expected it. So for many of us, when we have these difficult situations or we want to have, you know, surprise deals or surprise, you know, risk that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we don't expect it, we start to behave and we start to try and do things in order to curry Allah's favor so he can show us that he is the person who fulfills his promise in this regard. Or they might want the rewards of the Akhirah. They've been watching Omar Suleiman's Jannah series. They've been seeing all of the stuff that's promised to the people of the Akhirah. And they said, yeah, you know, I want that. I'm going to fix up so I can achieve that. All of these things are noble pursuits, and I'm not belittling them in any way. And they're all individual motivations for people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then you start to get to more serious motivations. One of them is, embarrassment of the fact that Allah is looking at us. It goes beyond wanting a reward or seeking a, or being seeking refuge from a punishment. Just understanding the fact that Allah tells us, Hu ma'akum aina ma kuntum. He's with you wherever you are. Or that he is, ala kulli shay'in raqib, that he is observing everything. You realizing that you're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be a motivation for you to have taqwa and not do things that would that will destroy your relationship with him. And then having ilm, having knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having knowledge of the deen. Because Allah says in the Quran, ulama, that the people who truly fear Allah from amongst his servants are the people who have knowledge. Because if you don't know the gravity of the deen, if you don't know the gravity of the Quran, if you don't know the gravity of the commandments of Allah, it's easy to disobey them. But once you increase in your knowledge of the Qur'an, in your knowledge of the Hadith, in your knowledge of the religious sciences, you have more of a motivation to be on the straight path because you understand the seriousness of what is involved. And then we start to see another different type of worship. And this is the worship, we can say, of the Prophet We have a Hadith from Sayyidatina Aisha radiallahu anha. And the hadith of Aisha are always some of the most beautiful hadith because Aisha had access to the Prophet ﷺ in a way that nobody else had access to him because she was his wife and she was his favorite wife. And so the way he is at home with her and the access she has to him is different from the access the Sahaba had to him in the mosque or the Sahaba had to him in the battlefield or they had to him in public places. It's the hadith of Aisha that we see the love of the Prophet ﷺ, the care of the Prophet ﷺ, how he used to play with his wife, how he used to tease her, how they used to have jokes between each other, they used to run banter on each other. All of these things come in the hadith. But one beautiful hadith that we have from Sayyidatina Aisha is that the Prophet ﷺ was standing at night praying to Hajjud to the point that his feet were swollen. And Aisha looked at him and she said, why do you worship Allah in this way? When Allah has forgiven all of your previous and your coming sins. Allah tells us in Surah Fat that he's forgiven all of the sins. Whatever is coming from the sins that the Prophet ﷺ might do and whatever has passed. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ is free from sin. And so if any of us had been given that guarantee that Allah has forgiven all of our sins that we're going to do and we've done already. It's not just what you've done, it's what you're about to do. Allah says, do it, I've forgiven you. We wouldn't even be worshipping Allah to that level. But the Prophet ﷺ was more involved in worship after hearing that. And what was his response? He responded to Sayyidatina Aisha and he said, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful servant? His worship was motivated by the fact that he was grateful for the blessing that Allah had given him in allowing him to know him in the first place, in allowing him to worship him in the first place. This is a worship that is beyond seeking a reward or being scared of a punishment. Because at that point, the Prophet ﷺ knew that he had no punishment awaiting him. But yet he wanted to worship Allah more because of the blessing that he recognized in being gifted with Islam and being able to know who Allah is and follow the straight path. But then the ultimate motivation for taqwa, which brings us back to what we spoke about in the beginning of this majlis, the ultimate motivation for taqwa 
is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, or He tells the Prophet وسلم, to tell us in the Quran, Kul in kuntum Allah, Say to them that if they love Allah, they should follow me, and then Allah will love them back. And Allah tells the Prophet وسلم, when people are not practicing the deen around him in the way that they should be practicing it, he says, Don't worry if the people around you turn away from the deen. So because Allah will bring forth a people who He loves and who love Him in return. So look at these two verses. <clears throat> First verse, Allah tells the Prophet, tell them if they love me, follow you, and I will love them in return. And then the other verse, He says, He starts it with His love for them. He says, Allah will bring forth a people who He loves. And then they love him in return. Because one is talking about the alam al-arwah, the world of the spirits, and how that manifests in this world. And the other one is talking about when it manifests in this world, how it applies it to action. Because the only people that can be chosen to be from amongst the people who love Allah and follow the Prophet wasallam are people who had already been loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before he had even created the creation and breathed the souls into the bodies that we are in now. These are the people that were in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in pre-eternity. And on the day when Allah said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? They all responded, Bala, of course, because they knew Allah and they loved Allah and Allah loved them. And so when they come into this world and they have this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they want to return to that original presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah tells them, follow the Prophet وسلم, and I will love you. Because that's the time when you're included in the company of his servants who he describes. Ya oh, you nafs that has become purified and has attained peace and tranquility. Return to your Lord, pleasing and well pleased. Pleasing and well pleased or pleased and well pleasing because you're pleased with everything that comes to you from Allah, good and bad, because you know that it's Allah training you to return to him. And you're pleasing to Allah because you attributed yourself with the attributes of the Prophet ﷺ. You followed his sunnah. You followed the Quran that was sent down through him. And so Allah is pleased with what he sees from you because he loves the Prophet ﷺ and he loves anyone who resembles the Prophet ﷺ. So this is interesting because it's the nafs or the soul of the person that attains, that attains tranquility that is allowed to return to Allah. And so they will enter into the company of the servants of Allah and they'll also enter Jannah. But what is this peace and tranquility that allows us to return to Allah? What is this peace and tranquility which is the ultimate manifestation of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah bi zikrillahi katma'in al That is the remembrance of Allah that brings peace and tranquility to the heart. Can you remember something that you do not know? You can never remember something that you do not know. So Allah is making an indication through this that the soul or the heart knows Allah and wants to return to Allah and has this love and this yearning for Allah. And this is what we see manifest in every single human being. But they do not, they do not have the path of the Prophet وسلم, to take them back and fill that love in their heart. So they look for things to fill this love or to give this love to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They look for drugs. They look for relationships. They look for validation, they look for attention, they look for money, they look for houses, they look for cars, they look for everything that as soon as you obtain it, you still feel this yearning for something more. Because there's a hole in the heart or there's an emptiness in the soul that can only be filled by the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the deen is supposed to bring us to. And so with all of these actions that we're doing, Allah tells us that he's made fasting obligatory for us. In order for us to be conscious of him. 
because that consciousness is what puts us in his presence and allows us to fulfill this loving relationship that we have with him. Allah tells us to fast, Allah tells us to pray, and we know that prayer is the most important aspect of our deen, but why does he tell us to pray? The same way he tells us to fast, to have taqwa, is the same way he tells us in the Quran, Establish salah in order to remember me. And so this remembrance of Allah is what brings the peace and tranquility because the soul has returned to where it finds peace and tranquility. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka ya'ud salam Because Allah himself is peace and from him is peace and to him returns peace. And he named Jannah Daru salam the abode of peace. Because that is the time when you can be with him in the akhirah. But you don't have to wait for the akhirah to be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you realize how close Allah is to you and you follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you reach the stage where you love Allah and Allah loves you in return, you can be in his presence in this life. You can be in Jannah in this life. And inshallah, this gathering is one of the gatherings of Jannah because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith has said, whenever you see the gardens of Jannah, graze in them. And the Sahaba said, how can we see the gardens of Jannah when we live in this world? And he said, Hilqa the places where Allah is remembered, the circles where Allah is remembered, those are the gardens of Jannah. We can all feel the peace and tranquility in our hearts as we think about these things and as we reflect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence and what he's done for us by giving us Islam. And this is a peace or tranquility that you can't feel anywhere else. This is because you're in the presence of Allah as you're remembering him. As Allah says, man I am sitting with the person who remembers me. In reality, Allah is never absent from us. It's just about us realizing that he's never absent from us. And so fasting is supposed to be a training ground to help us remember the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you want to reach for the drink or the food or engage in the things that will break your fast, you remember that Allah is with you and Allah is observing you and Allah is watching you and you're in his presence and that causes you to abstain from that thing. And so if you continue to train yourself in this way, you reach the stage where you worship Allah as if you can see him, as the Prophet ﷺ describes in the hadith of Jibra'il. That you worship Allah as if you can see him. And if you cannot see him, you know that he sees you. And that is the pinnacle of the deen. That's the station that the Prophet ﷺ described as ihsan. And so this worship is not just the ritual worship of prayer and fasting, but it is how Allah described in the Quran, in the salati, in the suqi, wa mahiyai, wa mamati, lillahi rabbil alameen. That your prayer and your sacrifice and your entire life and even your death all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are all lived for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same way that he says, aqimu salah wa ita'i zakah, to pray and to give charity, is the same way he says, kulu wa ashrabu, eat and drink. Is the same way he says, fankihu, get married. It's the same way he says, siru fil ard, travel the earth. All of these things are commands of Allah, so all of these things are a form of ibadah. And all of these things are things that we should be doing as if we are seeing Allah whilst we're doing them. And in reality, the signs of Allah's presence are everywhere. It's just about us realizing that Allah is not absent from us, even if we ourselves are absent from him. And so the month of Ramadan is supposed to bring us that. The salah that we are doing is supposed to bring us that. And even the taraweeh, what's interesting is, the actual linguistic explanation of taraweeh, the translation is to seek rest. Because it's the taraweeh, remembering Allah, listening to the words of Allah, that brings that peace and that tranquility to our soul in order to return us to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll end the halakha by just reinforcing the fact that Allah commands us to fast in order for us to attain taqwa. Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ الْعَرَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ that the entire book is a guidance, but it's only guidance for the people who have taqwa. Allah commands us, and the first command that we see in the Quran is, Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqu rabbukum. Oh, mankind, have taqwa of your Lord. So taqwa is the goal and the motivation and the essence of all of the acts of ibadah, especially the acts of ibadah that we're doing in this month. But the motivation for this taqwa 
has many different motivations, but the highest motivation should be love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُونَ اللَّهِ If you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Then follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يُحْبِبْكُمْ اللَّهِ And Allah will love you in return. And everything that you're doing other than the sake of love, it might bring benefit, but love is the greatest goal and the greatest objective. And to love Allah and to have love and to have Allah's love for you returned, that is the greatest success and that's the greatest thing we could ever achieve. And that's greater than anything in the world and what it contains. And it's greater than anything in the akhirah and what it contains. So we pray that this gathering is included amongst the gatherings of people that Allah says when they establish these gatherings, that he will love them because they love each other in him. They sit down with each other in him and they visit each other in him and they spend on each other in him. And we pray that all of our acts of worship in this month are included in that, in that category as acts of worship that bring us closer to his love and acts of worship that manifest his love for us in our lives and in the hereafter. <laughs> Inshallah, I guess we'll start with Q&A. Anybody has any questions, just raise your hand and inshallah we'll pass around the mic. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. A question in regards to whenever you say, Oh, I love you for the sake of Allah, or you're doing something for the, for the sake of Allah, mm -hmm. there's always this like persona around it that when it's being said or something, that it's, Oh, you're just doing it for the sake of Allah, but you don't really need it, or you don't really need it, or it's, you know, it's not really true or something. Uh -huh. How do you kind of, how do you kind of that around that perspective? The only reason why we have an issue when people say things like, I love you for the sake of Allah, and we don't think it's real, is because we've divorced Allah from his attributes and his actions. In one of the classic texts of Aqeedah, uh, the Murshid al Ma'in of, Ima, of uh, Ibn Ashir, he talks about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that Allah is. That Allah is completely different from his creation and he cannot be compared to them. But he is one in his essence, his that, his attributes, his sifat, and in his actions, his afad. And all of them are included in the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he created us and he placed into us our attributes and our essences. So when you reflect on this, it goes back to, I remember the tafsir of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen by one of the great Senegalese shayukh, Shaykh Ibrahim Yas. He said, Allah says, all praise is due to him. And praise is only four types. Praise of Allah to himself, when Allah says, Alhamdulillah. Praise of Allah to his servants. So when Allah says, for example, you have an exalted standard of character to the Prophet Praise of the servants to the servants. So if I were to say, mashallah, you, 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 you're very eloquent. You ask me a beautiful question, I'm praising you. And if you were to say, you answered that question really well, you praise me. Let's hope you say that at the end. And then when we say, alhamdulillah, we're praising Allah. But all of these praises belong to Allah. Because when Allah praises himself, he's praising his own attributes. When Allah praises his creation, he created them that way and he placed in them the things that we're praising and they will come from him and return to him. So he's praising himself. When we praise each other, the good things that we see are all created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and belong to him. So we're praising Allah by praising each other. And then when we praise Allah finally, we're praising Allah directly. So if you love someone for the sake of Allah, it's not about loving them with an ulterior motive separate to what is already inside them. It's about recognizing the fact that what you like about that person, why you're interacting with that person, what it is about that person that brings you the love and the peace and the tranquility that you have when you engage with that person, or the actions that you're going to do with that person, are all created by Allah and belong to Allah anyway and are a reflection of his attributes 
and his names and a manifestation of his knowledge and his power and his ability. And that's a deeper way and a better way even of interacting with humankind because if you interact with any creation for the sake of creation, it takes away that sacredness and it takes away even your ability to overlook their faults. But if you're dealing with somebody entirely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're giving them a certain level and a rank and a sanctity because you're directly connecting that thing to Allah and you're not divorcing that thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say this, I love you for the sake of Allah, we're used to separating creation from the creator. We're used to seeing the product and not the person that produced it. We're used to seeing the art and not the person who made the art. When you go to an art gallery and you look at a painting, they'll be like, oh, that's a Van Gogh. Van Gogh's not in the room. The effect of his work, and his knowledge, and his ability are in the room. But whenever you see the picture, you don't see it as anything other than a Van Gogh. So when we see ourselves, when we see creation, we should see it as anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sense that we know that it was created by Allah, designed by Allah, all of the attributes in it that we enjoy of that thing are made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we love that thing, we're loving Allah. Because without Allah, that thing wouldn't exist and it wouldn't be the way that we love. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? We've got a sister. Now I so, um, my question was, what is a practical way to like purify your soul or constantly be in a state of purification for someone who isn't like a person of Ain? Like an example is like um, we could get desensitized to like our ibadah that we like do on a daily basis, like prayer, right? It's just like muscle memory in a sense mm -hmm. or volunteering at the masjid regularly. Um, in the beginning, it could have started off as like wanting to be of service to your community. But over time, it's like, oh, I have to be here at this time, this part of the week or whatever it may be, or actually f having that connection with the Quran. Like maybe your heart got your heart has gotten hard or like maybe desensitized to these acts of worship. So like for a person who isn't constantly like in Islamic books or like around Mashaykh or whatever, maybe are very educated, how do we be constantly, like what's a practical way to constantly be in a state of purification or how do we like restart, like dethaw that heart, right? And like have it pumping and like genuinely love I would say two things. The first thing is the peace and the tranquility and the fulfillment that you seek from ibadah. You can only do it if all of your ibadah is a form of dhikr, as I mentioned earlier. Because Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inun kulub. That only the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring peace to the heart. And so for many of us, as you said, when we do our acts of worship, it becomes a muscle memory thing because we think of the obligation rather than of it as a way for us to reconnect and remember Allah. And that can be as small as us not reflecting even on the meanings of what we're reciting when we pray or reflecting on the significance of what we're doing when we're engaging these acts of worship. So you mentioned, for example, community work and working with your community. There's a really amazing hadith and a very strange hadith but it's an authentic hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, a man will come to Allah on the day of judgment and the person was, and Allah will say to the person, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't visit me. And the person will think and respond, how can you be sick and you're Rabbul Alameen? How can you be hungry and you're Rabbul Alameen? How can you be naked and you're Rabbul Alameen? And Allah says, I had a servant that was hungry. And if you had fed that person, you would have found me there. I had a person who was sick, a servant who was sick. If you were to visit that person, you would have found me there. I had a servant who was naked. And if you had clothed them, you would have found me there. And so all of these acts of worship are meant to connect us to Allah. They should be forms of dhikr. It's not just about sitting down with the tasbih and saying Allah's names. But your salah, Allah says, 
وأقيموا الصلاة لذكر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم remember Allah says إن الصلاة تنها عن الفحشاء والمنكر وذكر الله أكبر that Salah prevents you from doing evil deeds and wrong actions but remembrance of Allah is greater so any act that we're doing that's separated from that dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering his presence, we're not going to find fulfillment in that because it's disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the way we can reconnect with that in one aspect and in another aspect. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Inshallah, yeah. Yeah, Bismillah. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I was looking around trying to find out where you were. Bismillah. <laughs> so the question is like how do you love someone for the sake of Allah if you don't necessarily like like them as a person <laughs> I don't know how to say it like like someone necessarily like their character or you just don't get along with them for x y or z and I know like it's kind of like shaitan makes us like dislike each other especially like in this like brothers and sisters in Islam but how do you like find it in you to kind of like them and put kind of barakah in your relationship even though it's not really the best alhamdulillah i understand that on a personal level yeah i understand that and so it's about the relationship and he gives an analogy he says to the husband if you hate them or if you dislike them you may be disliking something in which allah has placed abundant good you just can't perceive the goodness in that person because you have been you have been shown the side of that person that you don't like. But anyone that's a Muslim and anyone that's created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there should be some kind of goodness in that person, even if you don't know it. You have patience that Allah will reveal that good, then inshallah, you can have patience with that. Loving for the sake of Allah sometimes it's not always easy. It's not always, you know, we have this romanticized ideal of love. We feel like love should be flowers and rainbows and, you know, the sweet stuff all the time. But love is also about pain. Love is also about sacrifice. Love is also about patience. And the same way Allah has his jamal, he has the attributes of Allah that we love. He also has his jalal. He has the attributes that we have to have patience with. And the entirety of creation is just going in between that jalal and that jamal, that usr and that yusr, the shukr and the sabr, the gratitude and the patience. But the patience always bears rewards and the patience always bears fruit. So if we think about, for example, Allah manifests to us in different ways. When Allah was manifesting himself to Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he took the form of a burning bush. That burning bush that Musa saw it's not the most beautiful or it's not the most um, loving of manifestations, but what he needed was in that manifestation. And he approached it because it had something that he needed. He said, maybe I can take some fire from it or maybe I can find some guidance. And when he went, he found Allah there. So it's the same thing with all of these people. Sometimes when Allah tells us that he will give us risk from where we never expect it, Maybe it's the people who we do not expect to bring good to our lives or the people that we do not expect to be the people who benefit us, that will be of the most benefit. We just have to have patience and look over that initial obstacle. As I'm talking about it, I'm thinking, so, as in I'm thinking of the people that, <laughs> that put me in that situation, but it's having someone with them that Allah can manifest something beautiful through them. So perhaps we dislike a thing and it's good for us. Perhaps we love a thing and it's bad for us. And perhaps we may dislike something or someone in which Allah has placed abundant good. We just don't perceive the good at the time. So just having that hustle and having patience is something that can bring us forward, inshallah. Bismillah. Uh, is it clarification from something from your speech? Hmm. You mentioned that one of the motivators was tied to reward in this world, mm -hmm. like praying more when you want a business deal. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know to what extent is this allowed? I was told we shouldn't be bargaining with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather we should be praying and doing these acts of worship regardless and not in exchange for favors. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking for some clarification. Yeah. So I mentioned in terms of these are the motivations that people have rather than these are the motivations people should have. 
So I was just highlighting the fact that Ibn al-Juzay was highlighting that there are different levels of worship of Allah. And one of those levels is people want rewards of Allah in this life. And it's not something that we should... Um, the motivation, the ultimate motivation should be love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, for any reward in this life or the next. But then the rewards of this life and the next are also given to us as motivations. We shouldn't worship solely for that. But at the same time, it's completely permissible to engage in worship due to that. And we have examples of the Sahaba and examples of the Salaf doing this. But it shouldn't be the ultimate motivation. I was just clarifying that it can be the case rather than it should be the case. It's not the most ideal case. But at the same time, it is a form of impact because you're having hope in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah promised us, whoever has taqwa, he'll provide for them a way out of their difficulty and he will give them risk from where they never expected. So you hoping that Allah will fulfill this promise and having aspirations towards that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not the highest aspiration, but at least it's a form of aspiration. And then hopefully when you get that, Allah can move you to different levels and different levels until you reach the stage where you worship him for his sake alone, inshallah. Yes. Salaam. Wa alaikum may Allah bless you for the knowledge that you gave us today. Um, I just wanted to quickly touch upon the the levels of taqwa that you were mentioning, and I did write a couple notes um, on them, but um, as you mentioned, it's kind of like a journey and levels that you go through, and I think um, to fully realize these stages, I think it's not it's not an easy process. Obviously, you have to go through life experiences and um, understandings to actually have each stage click for you. Um, and that like that, that's, you know, there's one thing where you can kind of learn these things where obviously I, I could read it and then you could tell me about it and I can be conscious of these things, mm -hmm. but there's another thing to kind of fully go through these experiences. Um, and then to the point where like you ponder and you think and you reflect, and then it finally clicks. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you go to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. Um, but what I fear the most is kind of ha having that moment where it does click and you realize, okay, like it's kind of like the immense sense of gratitude that you feel when something you, you realize, oh, this is Allah has given me this. But what I fear the most is kind of as human beings, we tend to forget and we tend when our lives change, we tend to kind of um, not forget, but, um, forget about like, the feeling, like, the feeling and the understanding of the breath. So, so I, I, I was just wondering if you could comment on like, uh, what uh, what to deal, how to deal with that, that kind of situation? Uh, because uh, because I, I think that's one, one thing that I need to do for after understanding something, but something that I think I need to mention a lot more, like, you know, uh, your heart changes after you finally understand something. Mm. So one of the verses that came to mind when you were saying that is, Allah tells us, and remember your Lord when you forget. The remembrance that I mentioned earlier through Salah, through dhikr, through all of these gatherings and these things are meant to bring you back to that stage. And the word insan, human being, comes from nisyan, to forget. Because when Allah breathed the souls into the bodies, we forgot about him. And then the entirety of our journey is our journey of remembering him. So it's completely natural to go through these stages of worshipping, being on point, and then forgetting, and then reminding yourself because that is the struggle between your spiritual nature and your physical nature. Your physical nature is there to make you forget Allah and your spiritual nature never has forgotten Allah. And you are an interplay of those two things. So your soul knows Allah and your body doesn't. And your mind is trying to battle between those two. And so it's a constant journey. Um, in terms of you mentioning it being a journey and struggle, can you drive? So you know when you drive, you have the theory and then you have the practical. You study all you're meant to study and you're meant to know about the road in the theory. You read the books. I think now they have apps and stuff. They show you like the lights, what it's going to look like, what you're supposed to do in complete different situations. But you never truly have that knowledge until you go on the road, you get in the car and you have that practical. The Quran is the theory and the action of the Quran is the practical. So when we say, for example, in Fatiha, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاتُ مُسْتَقِيمُ Guide us to the straight path. Where do we find that hidayah? 
ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين that the book is the guidance when Allah tells us in the Quran and he gives us all these similitudes and he gives us all these things to work with that's all fiqh you can open the Quran and you see والشمس والدحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يخشاها Allah swears by the sun and its light and the moon when it follows the sun and the day when it reveals the light and night time when it conceals the light if you read the book inside your room and you don't go out and see the sun and see the moon and see the day and see the night you have the theory but you don't have the practical and so the combination of the two is yeah we sit here in the gatherings we remember Allah we talk about the theory of living according to that zikr and then the practical now the real test is following that sirat al mustaqim it's a path the straight path or if we think about it the journey from one place to another is this journey from islam to iman to ihsan that's why it's called a sirat it's a path and you want to drive that path with the theory that you have and live the practical and that's what it's all about but these things are the things that help us remember when we forget these things are the things that help us reconnect when we become disconnected but you're never going to be in a state of constant remembrance and constant reflection if you're not constantly in a state of acting and doing these things like the sahaba who came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said whenever we're with you it's amazing because we live as if we can see jannah it's as if we can see jannah and we can see nar and we are in the presence he said and then as soon as we leave your presence we go back to our normal lives and we forget so this is something even the sahaba had to deal with and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him wallahi if you continued in that state the angels would come and shake your hand in the middle of the road he said but there's a time for this and a time for that there's a time to forget and there's a time to remember but without the forgetfulness the remembrance wouldn't be of any significance the same way without the night time covering the light of the sun there would be no significance of it shining in the day and without the moon appearing to us when the sun has disappeared there will be no significance of us knowing what the sun is in the first place allah uses all of these things to reinforce the message and keep us reminding him of his presence but you're good don't worry <laughs> um, there are no there. Uh, i will ask you to close that's okay just a couple announcements before that um ustad uh, Mustafa Briggs will be joining us next week as well, next weekend, um, along with the Ustad Abdurrahman Murphy, as well as Sheikh um, Amar Al Shukri. He'll be here next weekend as well. Will we all be here on the same day? Sorry to interrupt. You. Um, Abdurrahman Murphy and yourself will be here on the same day. Oh, nice! I was just with him in <laughs> Dallas, and I was yeah. All right, nice. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. A conversation <laughs> with both of you, inshallah. Okay, lit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I mean, I'll be here. <laughs> I hope so, inshallah. Um, you guys can follow at Isna Hub to stay up to date with any schedule changes um, as such. Uh, and any other programming about the iftars, everything will be there. That's kind of our central place for all things youth related. Um, typically, our Sunday sessions don't go too late. This was an exception today. So just to keep in mind that we are considering that you guys have jobs and school in the morning, inshallah. Um, yes, Monday. Okay, it's just one thirty. My apologies. Yeah. No, no, we're good. Um, okay, so with that, I'll let you close us off, inshallah. Allahumma anta al-awwalu falaysa qabla ka shay, wa anta al-akhiru falaysa ba'da ka shay, wa anta al-zahiru falaysa fawka ka shay, wa anta al-batinu falaysa duna ka shay. Fakun lana ya awwalu, ya akhiru, ya zahiru, ya batin, waliyan wa nasira, anta waliyuna wa maulana, fa ni'ma al-maula wa ni'ma al-nasir. اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من كول وعمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من كول وعمل اللهم إنا نسألك من الخير كل عاجله وعاجله معلم من هو معلم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كل عاجله وعاجله معلم من هو معلم نعلم يا الله you are the one who the first and there is nothing before you you are the آخر the last and there is nothing after you you are the ظاهر the manifest and there is nothing in front of you and you are the باطن the hidden and there is nothing beyond you so we ask you by your names ya allah al awwal al akhir al zahir al batin to be for us a guiding protector and a friend because you are the best support you are the best protector and you are the best friend ya allah we ask you to grant us jannah and everything that will bring us closer to it and to keep us safe from the hellfire and everything
faith that will bring us closer to it. And we ask you to grant us all good in this world and the next of what we know and of what we don't know and protect us of all the evil in this world and the next of what we know and we don't know. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih li ma ughlik wa khatimi li ma sabak ma asr al-haqq bil-haqq wa al-hadi ila siratik al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqq qadrihi wa middari al-adim Subhana rabbika rabbil aizati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Alhamdulillah